damned if they do and damned if they don't, because then if they don't acknowledge it, they uh, incur the, the wrath of those of us who spend our time uh, concerned with issues like empirical evidence. But this book, Jonathan Case book, I think has served the function of acting as a catalyst to ignite a whole uh, discussion on you know, how crazy the conspiracy theorists are conflating people who believe Elvis is alive and mm -hmm. the moon mm -hmm. landings didn't happen with, you know, people who look at reasonable questions like how the Building 7 collapsed. So one thing Jonathan Kay does is kind of guilt by association in his book. He mm. conflates uh, disparate uh, theories and theorists together uh, under the rubric of conspiracy theorists. Uh, you know, people like Richard Gage, of, uh, Gage often emphasize, well, they're not, con they're not positing any theory, right? Jonathan mm -hmm. Kay is defending... Uh, conspiracy theory that 19 Arabs with box cutters conspired to, you know, with people in caves in Afghanistan to or orchestrate the events of 9-11. So he's got a theory to defend. But people who just look at the dust of the Twin Towers or, you know, look at uh, how big was the hole that was in the Pentagon relative to a, a big aeroplane, such questions aren't really positing any theory. But Jonathan uh, t tends to uh, infer from people who ask those questions that, 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 that this is involving theories about conspiracies and that, that's you know a fraudulent claim actually a mm. dishonest claim by Jonathan the whole book is generally dishonest what's very telling is the the adulation that he's getting in much of the mainstream press from the Wall Street Journal to the BBC they're content to uh, buy into the psychoanalysis that Jonathan Kay's done of various members of the 9-11 truth movement one big revolution in academia, I don't, probably many of your listeners know and you know, has been the, the postmodern revolution over the last 30 years, and that entails relativism, right, where there's, you know, at its most extreme extent, the belief that there is no such thing as truth, that everyone's opinion is valuable. Jonathan in the book argues that postmodernism is the reason why so many academics can get away with propagating fanciful theories, but in fact, Jonathan himself is you know, at a theoretical level, himself playing on the uh, postmodern uh, emphasis in, in, in society, and because he does subjective ad hominem uh, studies of, of individuals and uh, uses uh, the subjective qualities of certain individuals to infer that their, their arguments must be unreliable or false, which he's, he's playing the, the man, not the ball, should we say. Uh, he's playing the hockey player, not the puck. Yeah. Many of the conspiracy theorists I've interviewed as I said, are highly intelligent people who come from fields uh, demanding technical fields in which they have spent their lives piecing together uh, little bits of data. Uh, for, uh, these are mostly men who spend their lives trying to piece together data through their professions. And uh, late in their career, they're looking for another intellectual exercise. And I know this will appear condescending. Uh, and conspiracism fits the bill because it allows them to apply their considerable brain power to what is essentially a giant puzzle. A puzzle of 9/11, or the puzzle of Barack, puzzle Barack Obama's identity. Well, it tends to be, as I say, men at a certain stage in life who are looking for an intellectual puzzle. Richard, and does that describe you, Barry? I don't like Jonathan Kay defining and describing me. He's been. He's. He, I don't fit almost any of your stereotypes about a conspiracist. And by the way, the the besides you're not looking at evidence in your book and you constantly don't look at evidence in your columns or in person or anything. And then you replace that with name calling. And it's very sly. I don't think I called you a name. Well, a crank. Well, actually, crank is a term of endearment. Oh, I, yeah, actually, sure. I, I, I talk about cranks. I, I... So I'm just saying how, you know, Jonathan, um, he alleges that those of us who actually do care about truth and evidence and in a way who are rejecting the postmodern theoretical disposition in existence in, in the journalistic academic complex. Those of us who reject uh, postmodernism and relativism embrace the concepts of absolute truth, the scientific method, the Cartesian logic and so on. The, uh, Jonathan, he rejects evidence, rejects the uh, belief in truth, and focuses on the subjective qualities of different theorists and theories. Often he selects the more extreme theorists, such as David Icke, who believes theories surrounding lizards. And, you know, when, when Jonathan Kay was on uh, Steve Pakin's uh, TVO show, uh, The Agenda, you know, they showed a clip which they dubbed uh, the lizards and the Jews and so on, trying to, uh, again, try and uh, discredit those of us who ask reasonable and uh, refined questions to do with 9-11 uh, and portray us as people who believe in uh, lizards controlling uh, humanity and uh, as anti-Semites, which most of us, you know, would of course, reject as people who, 
you know, understand the events of World War II, the serious uh, genocidal um, effects of the Nazi war machine, which was sponsored, of course, by people like Henry Ford, IBM, and various oligarchs and capitalists. Uh, who were peppered throughout the world funding the Nazi war machine. And, of course, learning from the events of World War II, we now see similar themes occurring where Islamic people are now the, the whipping boys, are now the scapegoats for um, the defense of imperialism, capitalism, and the Israeli settler colony in the Middle East. Uh, the Israeli government, I believe, are really heavily uh, implicated in the war on terror because they've now achieved what Professor James Petrus, a sociologist, based in New York, uh, Professor Petrus has called the globalization of Zionist power in, in recent history, because, of course, uh, if it wasn't for 9-11, we probably would have seen Israel lose support from the United States of America, go down the same uh, alley that uh, South Africa went down, South Africa's ethnic nationalist project, of course, uh, once it was no longer useful within the context of the Cold War, where South African mercenaries used to uh, make encroachments into countries like Angola that sought to nationalize and control their resources, once that was no longer needed it within the Cold War context, the uh, United States abandoned and Britain abandoned it, the white minority regime in South Africa. Israel, thanks to 9-11, now has its 100, 100 years war against the Islamic world. Uh, and if we look at who many of the neoconservatives were, from Wolfowitz to Feist to Richard Pearl and the people involved in the project for the New American Century, Many of them had very close ties to the state of Israel. Jonathan Kay, incidentally, uh, he's involved with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He's a fellow there. I know. Isn't that uh, wonderful? Yeah, well, Jeff Blanford, uh, who's a, a journalist, uh, a very credible journalist uh, involved in the Israel-Palestine issue, he characterized that as a, as a Zionist lobby that changed its yeah. name after 9-11 yeah. uh, and went into action <laughs> producing propaganda for the war on terror. So we have Jonathan Kay. He really brings uh, the Israeli question to us in, in his book. Book up on the screen. It's a tremendous piece of work. Among the Truthers, oh, the subtitles, a journey into the growing conspiracy underground of 9-11 truthers, birthers, Armageddonites, vaccine hysterics, Hollywood know-nothings, and internet addicts. Uh, the author is Jonathan Kay, the publisher is Harper Collins. I'm going to keep... Okay. Well, we may or may not be back in a few moments, and we have to discuss them because why not? The Jews. Back in a few moments. Corinne Show. See ya. I promise the Jews, you'll get the Jews. Yeah. Uh, euphemisms are used. So sometimes when conspiracy theorists talk about the neocons, mm. uh, or they will talk about uh, the Rothschild Zionists, um, they, what, it'll be a code word for Jews. So we have Jonathan Kay. He really brings uh, the Israeli question to us in, in his book by uh, conflating uh, anti-Semitic theories with credible questions about 9-11, by uh, claiming that 9-11 was a crime of Islam. He said that people like Dr. Kevin Barrett, who seek to exculpate uh, Muslims, that they are uh, absolving Islam of a, of a terrible crime. So we see the kind of uh, hate, brinkering on hate speech, really, the uh, attempt to blame a, a crime that is alleged to have been done by 19 members of a group, of a, of a particular religious group. And then from that, you generalize and demonize a whole swathe of humanity, now that's the kind of thing we saw the Nazis do. It's a kind of, uh, you know, again, guilt by association. As it happens, the alleged hijackers had nothing to do with Islam. We, we know that uh, many of them were seen engaging in, in very un-Islamic activities, such as drinking, attending strip clubs, taking drugs, and so on. One even uh, blasphemed against uh, God himself. And so uh, these aren't Islamic people. These aren't jihadis uh, willing to die for the Quran. These are most likely, uh, you know, intelligence agency, probably Mossad or... CIA-controlled patsies who serve the function of acting as uh, distractions uh, for, so the, uh, the towers could be brought down on 9-11 and this launching of this war against uh, Israel's enemies could be waged. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does uh, Kay go into the background, uh, the, the history of the term conspiracy theory? Did, did, does he place that in a historical context? Uh, yeah, he does attempt to do that, actually. And it, interestingly, it's quite funny because uh, he obviously he's uh, trying to use this phrase conspiracy theorist, but he's a conspiracy theorist. As I mentioned earlier, yeah. the official story of 9-11 is a quintessential uh, conspiracy theory. And so he attempts to uh, refine the, the definition of conspiracy theorist. He cites uh, a, some professor in, uh, in Oxford, you know, tries to make... You know, put it under the guise of an academic uh, okay. theory, but, you know, and it's got so many conditions, like they must believe in uh, 
governments engaging in nefarious acts and not willing to entertain evidence to the contrary of their arguments and so on. Again, even this redefinition of conspiracy theorists, which appears early on in the book, uh, Jonathan Kay's guilty of this himself because he, he doesn't uh, revise his position on 9-11 that, you know, Building 7 came down from office fires. So basically any time that we see someone smoking a cigarette in a skyscraper now, we're going to have to tell them, put that out because the whole building could collapse in seven seconds if you're not <laughs> careful. Uh, I have the book right here. If I turn to page 20 of Jonathan's book, it's very telling that after two years or three years of researching the 9-11 subject, uh, the, only, uh, the only documents he could cite to direct his readers to that he believes uh, offers a, a defense or support for the official conspiracy theory of 9-11 uh, is the blog Screw Loose Change mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the NIST report, the 9-11 uh, Commission report, and about two, may maybe three other um, books. One is The Looming Tower, which doesn't look into the actual empirical evidence of what happened on 9-11 presupposes the official story of 9-11, that book. Mm -hmm. And so basically what's quite telling, and it's, it's quite a victory for us in a way that, you know, a, a mainstream, well-paid, well-funded uh, editor of, of one of the world's, you know, most significant newspapers, after two to three years of research, could only come up with a blog, uh, a, a, a blog that engages in ad hominem attacks against various 9-11 skeptics, or politicized uh, government documents such as the NIST report or the 9-11 Commission report. So again, it's, it's quite telling that, you know, Jonathan uh, doesn't really have any evidence. You know, it's like the emperor's new clothes, you know. You can see through mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and see that it's really an attempt to uh, portray 9-11 uh, skeptics who are exculpating, who are exonerating Muslims, who are exonerating the people who we've had this global war and terror waged against. It's an attempt to discredit them portray them as nut jobs, uh, dehumanize them, and encourage, say, 40 or 50 percent of society not to join uh, their ranks and participate in this, uh, this revolution, in this quest for 9-11 for truth. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think that this book's designed to, you know, make a, a kind of argument that you'd expect someone in a university to make, you know, with consistent premises and conclusions, uh, empirical evidence. It's a piece of rhetoric, an attempt to win over, say, 40 or 50 percent of society they might read from time to time. And I think that's the main thrust of the book. He's not really attempting to engage in serious uh, scholarly arguments. And so I think from especially people involved in academia and in universities, you know, Jonathan Kay's books really are viewed as quite substandard. But unfortunately, there's some people in society who, you know, are less academic, you know, don't, aren't engaged in... The, the battle the of ideas, but yeah. you read books from time to time. And I think that what's sad is that they might be uh, hoodwinked or believe this uh, propaganda by the editor of the National Post, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, you know, can be quite damaging to our society. And you can imagine, for example, if the Harper government decided to enshrine a law prohibiting 9-11 uh, conspiracism, uh, that this book would be uh, the kind of thing that, that make, would support such an agenda, would help to, to justify such... Yeah, criminalization yeah. of mm. the uh, of skepticism. That's unfortunate because he does have. Uh, oh, you know what, Joshua? Let me uh, tell our listeners who we're listening to, uh, uh, <clears throat> and we are listening to uh, Joshua Blakeney. Uh, he's in Calgary tonight. And uh, he's a, uh, a student at the uh, University of Lethbridge. Uh, well, uh, also, you are listening to the Unbought and Unbossed radio show, and the radio station is CHLY 101.7 FM. Okay, uh, I got that out of the way. And. Uh, now, Jonathan Kay also is uh, a metallurgic, uh, metallurgical uh, a, a degree, which uh, is the, the, the study of, of, of metal and, yeah. and, and, you know, and what, what it does. And, you know, he, so he has uh, knowledge himself that it would be impossible for there to be, say, uh, you know, the molten metal underneath the three buildings for, you know, however many months it, it you know, remained uh, that the temperature that high. Uh, you know, so it, it's it's. It's just very clear that 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 it, you know he he's a big phony, you know that that he he, yeah. he has firsthand knowledge that would uh, you know prove that uh, the official story can't be correct. But uh, you know, of course, I I kind of doubt that he mentioned that in the book, did he? Uh, no, he doesn't. He, he he mentions, I think, in passing uh, his credentials, which are quite formidable and esteemable uh, credentials. He has a, a law degree from Yale. I mean, those those don't come easily. Um, he has his undergraduate and I believe a master's degree in, in metallurgy and so as you, as you accurately say 
metallurgy is an important field in 9-11 studies. I mean, 